<laughs> no, no, no. I've got I've got the phone number. So if he's not picking up, I'm gonna give them a call. What's this telling me? All right, the meeting is on here. Oh. <clears throat> Morning, Peter. Hello. How are you? Oh, I want to get out. <laughs> it's, yeah. been, it's been too long now. Yeah, it's, not fun, it's not funny not anymore. Funny anymore. No, it's uh, getting a bit dull on the weekends. I don't mind working from home. Yeah. Oh, it's oh, like it's I've got a mess. I've got a big section, so I, I can do a lot here. All right, but I've done everything that I can imagine. What what needs to be done for the the rest two years? So nothing to do anymore. Yeah. Ah, so we're uh, I've got your presentation. Thanks, uh, Carlo. Good. Yeah. Um, we're waiting on uh, Philip, is it? And yeah, Philip. Philip hasn't. Except Scott did, so Scott is now in. Oh, good. So and uh, but uh, Philip didn't accept the meeting, but it's with him that I basically arranged it. But oh yeah, I assume when oh. I assume because Scott is in now that that Philip will be in as well. In yeah. The yes. I sent the invite to Neville as well, but he couldn't make it. Or oh. I don't know. Um, you should be. Um, I'll give him a ring. Yeah, because he's got the invite. He just didn't accept it. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, sort of early mornings, a bit awkward for operations uh, staff. Hang on. Pieces. Yeah. We'll give him a tickle up. See what happens. See what's happening. We need to kick off, I suppose. When you, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, Scott, is uh, Philip coming as well? Oh, good day, Nev. Um, I haven't talked to him about it, but just sent him a message, so I'll see if he replies. Yeah, we've got the yeah. We, yeah, that would be nice. There he is. Oh. Hey, howdy. Good morning, Philip. Hey. How are you? Hey, hey. hey. Just a bad luck there. Yep. Alrighty, we'll catch you later. Oh, the timesheets, isn't it? You'll get those. When will we get those? We just talking to Neville, see if he can join as well. He he didn't see the meeting last uh, time. Yep, early, yeah, late morning. Yeah, okay, catch you. See you. Bye. Oh, sorry about that. Neville can't make it. He's okay. um, he's uh, we had a you know, mountain and a lot of rain over the weekend, so yep. uh, yeah, know. need some attention, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, first, uh, I'll start the presentation in a second. Before we start, I'll show you the units. This is the DO sensor. The solid sensor basically looks the same. Here you see the DO. Um, three points where we do the cleaning. If you want to change it, all you have to do is you take it out, put the set, uh, basically plug the sensor out, and put another sensor in that could be optical or, or, or clock cell. Screw it back on, hand tight, and you just drop it back into the water. That's basically how you replace a cell. Um, for calibration, you just lift it just above the water and press cal. That's a DO sensor, so full stainless, weighs about, uh, about a kg. The inline solid sensor, that's this unit. Um, it normal it comes with a big ball valve because it's hot tap removal. And this unit basically just sits in in the, in the pipe, so we supply the nipple as well. Uh, once it's mounted, basically it measures the solids up to five percent with an accuracy of a lab sample. And we tell people with the training, so we we come and help to do the commissioning. Don't touch it anymore. That's basically the whole idea. Now. 
we know from experience a lot of people nowadays these use um, stability sensors to measure solids. That's been been used for years and years and years, mainly in New Zealand as well. Uh, we came in 2014. We started with a new product, Zerlik, and that's the presentation I'm going to share now with you guys. You can all see this. Yep. yep. Yeah, I've seen it twice before. I just reread it, so uh, I don't know how other people have seen it. Whether whether you want to go through the whole thing or no, I'll I'll skip a whole bunch of stuff because yeah, like in, in the beginning. So um, what what you'll see, for instance, yeah, what's a wastewater treatment plant? I think we all know that. Or a water treatment plant. It doesn't matter which one it is. So for Sirlik, it doesn't matter. The most important thing is um, mainly how how we use it, what how it works. So basically, um, the unit uses an LED, uh, 880 nanometers wavelength. That basically means that we can see particles that are more uh, uh, bigger than 0.4 microns. That is the same as your um, the filter you use in your dry weight sample. That is that filter is basically a 0.4 micron filter. So we can um, we can basically tell people that the accuracy that we have is the same as your lab sample. That's how you do a calibration single point with the lab sample. Um, the good thing with the unit is basically um, that we measure the strength of the LED as well, and we measure the temperature. So we compensate for both. Big gap in, in the middle, that is basically so we don't have uh, uh, big chunks of whatever get stuck between, because of course, if that happens, you, you have an issue. This little black dot you see here with the three little holes, that is basically, I'll give you a, a close up. That's, this is basically the, the cleaning. So with high pressure, well, high pressure up to two bar water it, or air, we spray it from those three, lens, uh, three little holes directly onto the lenses. So the cleaning is very effective with these units. Ah, this is for the geeky amongst us. Uh, how do we calculate the, the milligrams per liter? It's the Bill Lambert law. We basically uh, measure everything. So uh, it's very easy for us to do a calibration and a calculation. You can do this uh, by hand if you want. What's the main difference against stability? Well, first of all, we don't see color. So if you got uh, water or you got tea, for instance, if we put our sensor in T, it will come up with zero. You put a turbidity sensor in T and it just goes it goes nuts. That's the big difference with our sensors. So for dairy people, if you want to see color, if you want to see uh, milk escaping or something, we can't see that. We only see solids. Yeah. The big thing is that we measure um, we measure through absorption of the light transmission while turbidity measures scattering of light. That's the main difference. The problem with turbidity is, of course, that you measure in NTU units, and then you have to put a factor in there, a mathematical factor to create milligrams per liter. While near infrared technology, we our output is immediately milligrams per liter. Uh, like I said, easy calibration against the lab result. Um, clean water for us is zero. So. You put it in a glass of water, it should be zero. Very easy. You normally don't have to do that with commissioning, but after a few years, we always tell people to once a while check it in, in clean water because you could have fouling on the sensor, on the surface of the glass, um, and then, of course, your zero is off. But it's very easy to see that. Um, it's only affected by particle size for us, uh, not the correct the physical characteristics of the particles. Of course, if you do scattering, if you got a round particle or a square or a triangle, it, it doesn't it changes it. And the main advantage against the is our sensors do not drift. So basically, once we install them and you do a calibration, you don't really need to touch them anymore for calibration wise. People still trial it and test it. Now, of course, when we told everybody that nobody believed us. So in 2015, the Rufunoe District Council did a trial for the TSS census in an aeration basin in Levin. Um, basically, 
we had an endless and how to the hack a quad beam and our probe in, in one erasing basin here at the same depth and in the middle was a sampler that basically took a lab sample every so often um, here you see if we go a little bit closer these little red dots are actually the lab samples so for the endless and hauser one this is the calibration the curve so that's after calibration and so we were allowed to go in, install the units, calibrate them, and then we had to get out and the guys on site did everything else. So uh, people of Lutra, I believe. Um, so what they did, this is the output of the ENH. So they use a, a correction factor to bring it down and you can see that it actually follows the lab samples pretty good. But of course, if the sludge should have changed in concentration, you would have an, an issue. Um, the Hawk unit is uh, well has some issues with some drifting, but if you bring it down with the correction factor again, it's it's reasonably good. The quad beam has the same issue, lost data here, but I, I think that's more operator error. And but the longer it's in the product, the worse the 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 readings get. So this unit, this cleaning is not very effective. This actually is the raw data of the Serlik unit. So we have no corrective data. And the raw data was even more, uh, was more accurate than the corrective data of all the others. So, well, basically no comparison. This is the unit. And here you basically see how the cleaning works. Yeah, the first thing I did, the first time I did, I stood on the other side to the left and uh, left fence. But that's how the cleaning works. So it's the controller basically con the controller basically decides. Um, you basically tell it uh, how long to clean, when to clean, uh, how long to freeze the signal. So it's all adjustable. These are the sensors we have from Solik at the moment. This is the one that we use in aeration basins, DAFs, uh, in stormwater drains to measure consent requirements. So that unit basically measures up to 20,000, so 2%. Um, so very easy to use at 150, 200 milligrams a liter. We do have applications where we use that unit now. Tatoa is using it now for, I think, about four years. And uh, they now standardized on Serlik for the next upgrade that's, gonna, that's uh, coming. Inline units. Um, the inline units go up to 5%, mainly used in return and waste activated sludge. This unit, uh, basically the sensor looks the same as the sludge blanket unit. Same size, same uh, uh, thickness. That unit um, references all over the place. Uh, Panpeg is the biggest one. They've got about six. Uh, Rangitiki District Council's got one. New Plymouth had, had one. Uh, they took it out um, because we had issues with lagoon sludge. And lagoon sludge is black. Uh, that unit just as soon as black passes, you can't transmit the light anymore. So they had to go to a microwave units. Microwave units can measure up to 30%. Different technology, it's microwave, but uh, we can go up to 30%. If you want to go higher, we have other near infrared units, but yeah, not much used at the moment. What was that coming to a black sludge story? The, uh... Yeah, so if you got lagoon sludge, Lagoon sludge is very uh, black. The problem that we had with the light is it won't penetrate the sludge to get to the other side. So you can't basically measure it. So the unit basically freaked out every time we saw lagoon sludge. All the other times it was fine, but lagoon sludge is just black. It, it's like tar. It, it really, you could see a difference. As soon as it came in, you could see it straight away. Okay, I would have thought that units that are working on scattering, I'd imagine, would have a problem. But yeah, same. I mean, is, why, would, why would a unit that's working absorption have a problem with that? Yeah, like I said, because it was the concentration of it was so high that it just it just wouldn't go through. So that's okay. when we use the microwave. The okay. good thing is that we can actually, uh, we got a portable unit that we can actually test it before we actually commit to, to put something in. So it's very easy for us to test it. But that that was the only time we had an issue. Uh, all the others was very Hi. Hi. Pardon? A question for you. On your Serlik, can you have different path lengths? Or is that no. distance 
between the transmitter and the receiver? Is that always fixed? Can no. you have a small remote? No, so that's fixed. Fixed 880 nanometers. Yes. No, no, no. That's the wavelength, but the path length? No, so path like it, length is 20 millimeters. Okay, okay. So you can't have a two mil path length for really dirty stuff. No. Like, a good example. No. Okay. No, can't do it. It's unfortunately not with this unit. There's another. Uh, we we use trios where we can do that, but that's that's another product. Um, how we mount it? Well, we first we've got the rod and holder. That's what we use most of the time. So you just click it on the on the railing, and the unit just wiggles in, into the water. This is extendable up to four meters. It's like a big fishing rod. The inline unit, of course. Uh, we supply the nipple, the bell valve, so you just have to uh, drill a hole, weld us onto it, and everything screws in. Here you see a close-up of the uh, holder. The holder, basically this little lip, you can take that off and then you can slide the unit out without touching anything else. So it's very easy to take the unit out if you want to have a look. If something gets stuck maybe, or a big rag get maybe stuck in, in the unit, of course, then you can have to take it out. This is the um, uh, Waimakiriri District Council. I think this is Wood End or Oxford. No, Wood End, where you basically see uh, this is a TSS and a DO next to each other. This is the inline unit as the outlet of a DAF from uh, Panpack, where they use. Uh, they mounted this, I think, about three, four years ago. And now, like I said, now they standardized on it. The DO sensor, um, like I said, with the geosensor, we have optical or clock cell. We we are not more accurate or better than anyone else. This is exactly the same technology. We use the same sensors. Where we are, uh, where we know we are better is the cleaning. Like I said, from three points, those three points, we spray um, up to two bar water or air directly onto the lenses. So cleaning is very is very effective. The advantage, just like you saw this morning, is you can unscrew the cap here and just pop out the sensor and plug in another sensor. It doesn't matter if you got optical or galvanic. Very easy to do. We normally, at the moment, we stand standard. We supply a galvanic cell, but if people want an optical, absolutely not a problem. Here are the mounting. So again, the rod holder, and we have a slide rail as well. But yeah, we have. People who do it, um, hang it on a chain. Uh, like I said, as long as it's in the water, is fine. Yeah, it, it doesn't really matter how you do it. This is a nice way, but like I said, just make sure that you can take the unit out for whatever reason you want to do it. This is the controller, how it looks. So we have a BB1 and a BB2. The BB1 can take one sensor, the BB2 can take up to four sensors. Uh, what the unit basically does, it just takes the, the, the sensor. You can control the cleaning with the unit, uh, the 40, 20 milliamp output of the unit. You can set that. Uh, and for calibration wise, you basically use the controller as well. So ma mainly if we do the commissioning and we come on site, that is where we sit. And that's what I show you. The, the controller, we don't really touch the sensors anymore. You don't really have to. Here you see, that's, I think, Oxford at the Weimar District Council. Um, here you see the controller with the valve. So we supply the valve normally as well. But like I said, if you want to do that yourself, it's it's like if it's just a it's just a valve to transport the water, basically. I mean, that's all it is. Or air. I think they use air. Um, so yeah, why why we tell people why choose Solik? Well, mainly we tell it's mainly for the local support. So the guy you just heard was Owen. He's from our office. Uh, he's from Homishams. Homishams is a sister company from Peltham in the South Island. Um, Martin is also online with us. Martin is basically my colleague in, in Auckland. Uh, I travel all over the country, so you will always be supported locally. By, uh, so I live near Hamilton. I do uh, South Taranaki, basically the whole. The rest of the North Island. Um, build and cleaning, of course, low maintenance, and that's what we tell. Operators don't really need to touch these units anymore. This is what we would like to see in the wastewater treatment plants and water treatment plants, but yeah, this, this is a bit bigger. This is not us. Now your sludge blanket unit. 
the sludge blanket unit uses the same sensor. Yeah. Um, you, you know it's well, what people currently use is a sludge judge ultrasonic sensor or what we call an iometer. Uh, basically, you ju they just look. Well, that works most of the times. The problem is if you got, if you get the problem, this is what you want to see. So the sludge blanket system basically is what we call a yo-yo sensor. The sensor sits in here, goes down, measures whatever you need to measure, sludge, fluff, and goes back up. While it does that, it does spray water onto the sensor when it goes down, basically to wet the sensor. And when it goes up, it sprays the cable and the sensor clean as soon as it's in there. This is basically what you want to see. This is what you basically, yeah, that's not very good. And this is, well, that is very bad. The problem at the moment is that uh, most people use the pumps and they run only on timer. So you don't really know if you're pumping up water or actually sludge. Um, so the unit uh, is not very cheap because we're looking at around $18,000 for the unit, complete system. But you can reduce your cost very rapidly, mainly energy and chemical costs. This is what the unit basically output. So you give it a value for the fluff level and you give it a value for blanket level. When the unit goes down, two outputs, one will be fluff output. It will tell you where it finds in here 1000 milligrams per liter. And when it hits 1%, it will tell you exactly what the height is as well. Uh, output number three and four is basically depth versus concentration or height versus concentration. You can choose that. So basically you see the profile. That's basically how it looks like. In your SCADA system, you can actually create this. Uh, New Plymouth did a very good job of um, showing this on the screen as well while the sensor goes down. Um, this is basically what you want. But yeah, if you got this, an ultrasonic will have an issue with here because it will see this layer, not the actual layer. So there's a few things. A lot of things you can see that the unit will uh, give you. So a lot of detailed information. Now here is basically where you save your energy. So if you can pump sludge into your digester and you can actually say instead of 2%, I do three or four, you have a massive uh, reduction in, in costs. They did some studies. Uh, one was in Sweden, where they basically had a payback time in 26 days. But 700,000 kilowatt hour a year, this is a big pump. So it will be a lot longer in our cases, but I think you get the picture, right? Eh? Polymer dosing. Well, again, polymer dosing, very expensive product. Um, this unit will control your polymer dosing accurately. So even if you got a rain event, whatever happens, the unit will keep telling you exactly um, if you got uh, a lot of fluff or not or settlement. So it will basically control everything. And of course, you don't want to uh, truck out water. You want to truck out the sludge. The thing is, of course, um, early warning of settling problems. That's where these units uh, come into play. If you got an, a, a beautiful site um, where you got good settlement, then anything works. You can use a sludge jet, you can use an ultrasonic, everything works. It's when problems start to happen. That's when you want to see the units actually giving you the data constantly. That's what this unit uh, is valuable because when shit happens, this unit will keep giving you information. So basically, um, yeah, well, if you optimize in the beginning, the rest will follow. Yeah, it's 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 like I said, if you if you do it good in the beginning, the rest will follow automatically. This is basically how the unit looks like. What we supply is the unit, the bracket, the controller, and basically the background. That's the uh, inside of the unit, so it's a big drum where the unit goes through here. This unit requires a little bit of maintenance. Uh, normally, we tell people once a year, check that you not have uh, spider webs or anything called in here, because this is uh, a roller. All the rest is basically just, uh, yeah, again, don't touch it. 
Installations in New Zealand, we've got quite a few. Uh, we've got one in Rolleston. This is, I believe, this is either Rolleston or Tauranga. What you see here, this is just a PVC pipe. Uh, the reason why we put that on there is so when the sensor goes up and you get a high wind, it won't hit the railing here at the bottom or anything, or the scaffolding, whatever you've got here. So this is just a protection. That's all it does. So it's just a 90 mil PVC pipe. You just clamp onto it. Um, the right side, this is from Terra Tiamamutu. They had an unfortunate event where uh, a lightning hit the unit. Yeah, that we, we that doesn't it didn't doesn't, didn't like it. This is a Invercargill Branks home. I think this is a water treatment plant where we got a unit. They've got two units. Um, this is one at, at the clarifier. And the right side, this is the new Plymouth one. Now it looks like, well, really bad, but this is when they just started up, you see at the scaffolding, they were still building a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, we just installed and commissioned the unit. You see here, um, the water basically onto the, the muck. We basically just commissioned the unit, but yeah, the, the clarifier was, they were just filling it. So it was not really, really uh, up to scratch. Now, what's the difference again in ultrasonics? Well, first of all, we define it as a concentration, the slice level, where ultrasonics looks as looks basically at densities. Uh, we give you two levels, fluff and blanket, while uh, ultrasonic gives you one. Not very accurate, but gives you one level. We are not affected by sedimentation properties, while ultrasonic, if you have poor settling sludge, ultrasonic will get into trouble very quickly. We can show you also a profile. Um, you can't have that with ultrasonic, of course. And then the most important thing is that the sludge blanket system will work no matter what type of settling properties you have. It will always work. Ultrasonic, of course, is disturbed by changes in sedimentation properties or density. So it only works if you've got a beautiful, nice um, settling. Of course, uh, we can come to site and do a trial with a portable unit. The portable unit is basically identical, just no output, but this is a 220, uh, 250 point data logger. I can come to site, so I've got one unit with basically the three probes. Uh, Blanco is a sludge blanket sensor, OxyDU is the DO, and the solid sensor. It's like the 5% inline unit. I can just plug it in, Throw it in there and tell you tells you it tells you basically where the, what the profile is. Um, we normally use that. If you're interested, we use it to determine what the best position is to mount the unit. Um, also for your solids, that's what I basically use. If you want to measure solid somewhere, we just poke it in with this unit and we can tell straight away. Yeah, we can measure it. Yes or no. Just a portable. There are quite a few uh, smaller. Uh, councils, they bought the portable unit because they don't want to spend $18,000 on a sludge blanket or $10,000 on the inline unit or the um, submersible unit. They go with uh, the multi track the portable unit. Now, what do we have else in, with the infrared technology? We do have inline units to measure POD, COD as well. We can also measure nitrates in line or in a pond or whatever. Um, from Terity Amuto uses our nitrate sensor. These units, we can change the bandwidth, uh, the wavelength and the distance. We can change that with these units. And this is a company called Trios from Germany, where we have also full spectral analyzers. Uh, basically, it's a competition against SCAN. The, the difference is it's just, well, a lot cheaper, but that's the same thing. They use the same sensors, basically. That was it, guys. Now, um, any questions? I'm just going to go back to my screen. That, so that's a little, uh, we have, like I said, we have quite a lot of references. Uh, you and you know, we have heaps of them in Australia. So Sydney water is now standardized on Sirlik as well. 
um, I sent you all that little paper of, uh, I think it was Queensland. Uh, that guy, uh, I'm just waiting for a reply. If he comes back to me and uh, you can talk to him. Um, like I said, I did look up. Invercargill uses our sludge blanket system as well in water. It works fine, but they have issues. Something is on site that doesn't, that uh, kills the sensor. So we had uh, three units at one spot and all three of them failed the sensor. And we don't know what. So that unit is, uh, we're repairing it at the moment. As soon as I can travel, I'm going to Invercargill to have a look. But Adrian Cocker, he's, uh, he was more than willing to discuss with you how the sensor works and how it does. Um, the longer the unit we have in the system, the longest is at Watercare at Mangere. That was the first sludge blanket system that we installed many years ago, and that's still going. Um, Ontario Tiramuto is now two, two, almost three years old. I only went back uh, once just to have a look at the unit. So for more, for most of the service, I normally visit the region once in a while. I always drop by and I normally do the service on the units because it's basically visual uh, service. You just look at it. Uh, the whole idea is not to touch it. But um, yeah, that's Serlik. So. And like I said, we, we got the portable unit, so we can easily do a, a, a trial. We can show people. Uh, I can send you the details of that trial in Levin as well for solid sensors. But uh, yeah. So uh, I think in water in the water industry, it's it's um, not not so volatile as in wastewater, so it's it's pretty easy. What's the cost of the fixed unit without the winch? The fixed unit alone is around uh, normally around eight thousand dollars. All right. There's there's no IO on that, is there? Uh, yes, with the controllers, they always have forty twenty milliamp. You'd just be measuring at one fixed point in the blanket, so. Ah, the sludge. Ah, uh, the sludge blanket unit. That's basically yeah. You look at around uh, the. Uh, if you only want sludge blanket, and and uh, I think it's about 16, 16,000 for just a unit, and then you have two outputs, sludge blanket and fluff level. Is that, that that's with the winch unit though? Yeah, that's the winch unit. Uh, you want to, you think you're about the portable then? Well, what if you just had a single, um, just a unit, yeah, for a fixed level? So, Carlo, I think what. Well, what Phil is getting at is this is just on a drinking water clarifier and the primary reason is to understand that you're not getting flock carryover, so it's not to determine your whole blanket depth and um ah, so you and, not, and strength. So you the sensor, effectively, so, the so I think Phil's questioning was, well, if there was just a single point and you knew the, the strength there and you hit an alarm on that warning, that's okay. potentially an option that's rather than the full. Uh, you can easily use then the, the submersible one. It uh, looks like this, basically. That unit is around nine. That's everything included. The controller, um, yeah, eight nine thousand dollars, and you can just mount it at a certain height and uh, give it an alarm. It will give you four to twenty million. It'll tell you what the solids are in that area. Um, yeah, that, but that goes to two percent then. That's basically what you use as as a high level or low level. So yeah, if the fluff rises, the unit will pick it up, of course, as soon as it hits the sensor. And what's the story with the TRIOS agency in New Zealand? Um, are there multiple agencies or what, how does it work? Uh, TRIOS just got, uh, the, uh, there's a guy in Dunedin, Ike Breitbart, you might have heard of him. He basically is in charge of TRIOS in New Zealand, but the, the company just got bought by uh, Kessler Group. Um, Ike is, is is a scientist and not really good in selling. So we basically, and plus he he does he he talks more with the the scientists like the Niwas and and all the the, the stormwater guys while we do water wastewater. So we work together with him. So um, he just gives us like a commissioning fee 
but um, if if they go with trios units, uh, he will come down and set it all up. He's got his own little lab, so we work very closely together. We did a few projects together, um, mainly because he can only sell that unit while we have everything else around it as well. Because you need valves, you need sometimes you need uh, people want to measure flow as well. He can't do all that. He just made so we work very close together. But you can go direct to him and basically get the the trios units uh, from him direct. That's that's not a problem. Right, right. It's just that we work together because uh, in Australia, um, my colleagues that are the Serlic agents in Australia, they are now also the trios agents. But that's of course because uh, Ike lives here, not in uh, Australia. Okay. But yeah. We have uh, enough applications in in New Zealand as well for trios to for COD, BOD, uh, nitrate, uh, SEC two five four. We we got a whole range. Yeah. So Carlos, with your um, sludge profile, um, you mentioned. Am I switched on? Yeah, I think I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I've just lost the mute button. Um, yeah, do you have to sort of calibrate that if you're using the um, device that uh, runs up and down through the sludge uh, profile? Well, we calibrate it in the factory to normally around 3000 uh, ppm. Uh, so for sludge blanket, you basically don't really have to calibrate it because in, in uh, most of the cases, you don't care if it's 1.1 or 1.2 or 1. You want to know that that height, it's always the same, so it's consistent. If you want to know it exactly, then we calibrate the unit. Um, calibration is the same as with any uh, solid sensor. You put, put it in a bucket with sludge, you tell it this is a calibration point, mm -hmm. then you go um, analyze the sludge and you tell it in the controller what the sludge is, then it's calibrated. But it's not really needed, it just makes it more accurate. But um, the deviation is around. If you don't do a calibration, I think you're off by by 500 ppm's maybe. Um, if you do a calibration, you're bang on normally. But uh, the sludge blanket system it uh, increases the sludge concentration by 50 ppm's every time, while uh, the inline units work with uh, 0.1 to 0.2. So a lot more accurate. But um, yeah, so sludge blanket that's. The only thing you calibrate when I do the commissioning, I normally uh, set it up for your clarifier because you need to know how deep it is, of course. And uh, we check the 40 20 milliamp signals because that's where most people uh, go wrong, is with the ranges. Yeah, I think with the um, water treatment application, um, the single point uh, measurement, as Philip um, indicated, was probably more applicable. Yep. And um, I was just wondering how rugged the uh, the devices, you know, the head. It's built as a portable unit, but would it withstand being outside in the New Zealand um, sun? Not that, but the uh, the receiver, you know, the um, yeah, the, con the handheld piece. The handheld. Well, it's it's handheld, so you normally just go out and and do the measurements. Uh, you don't leave it outside in the sun all the day. Uh, it's not submersible. The the handheld unit. So um, we had an issue with water care where they put it in a bucket and left the bucket outside and start to rain. Well, then we have to basically uh, repair the unit. Uh, but the handheld, the display is designed for uh, when sun hits it, you can still see the display, but it also vibrates. So if you lower the unit, it will vibrate when you got your fluff level, it will tell you where it is anyway. So even if you can't see it on the display, you just lower it in because it's a data logger. You just lower it in, go all the way down, bring it back up, and then you can go inside and have a look. We'll tell you then what the profile is and, and high and low, whatever you set up for. The portable unit is for me very easy to come down and I think I showed you eh, last time when we were on the site. Yeah, I think you had. Yeah, it would be unit. very easy with the portable unit to just show you how it works. At, that's basically anyone can just chuck it in there. Unit will automatically recognize what sensor you're using. And um, yeah, it's that that works. That works a treat. But that's a portable, of course. So you, you don't have an output. You just have a data logger. 
So what's the price comparison between um, Tabidity uh, versus um, your, uh, your, your instrument? For the, for the inline units, um, you look at approximately almost the same price. It depends on uh, ENH is the most expensive one. Um, when they did the trial with the inline units, with the submersible units, Andres and Hauser was the most expensive one. Uh, then was Serlik, and then Quad Beam and Hawk was the cheapest. But again, uh, if you want to use a turbidity sensor there, you, you're going to have a lot of issues. You, you're going to need weekly calibrations. So you're going to spend a lot of time cleaning it, calibrating it, and, and we can we can assure you with these sensors. Once you install it, you calibrate it, uh, you set then the level to the fluff that you want to see. That's it. This, especially in a water treatment plant, you you set the cleaning so once a day or twice a day, and and that's it. For the next ten years, you just don't touch the sensors anymore. But that's the difference. And they don't drift. So whatever happens, don't drift. They just sit there. Do you call it? Yes. On the, on the question of turbidity and suspended solids, on the suspend, sorry, this is Owen from Homeshams. On the suspended solids, it doesn't matter what your particle are made of, what they what they con consist of, what their size is, or what the orientation is. With a turbidimeter, if you change your type of particle or the size range or the orientation, you'll get a different answer every time. Whereas with suspended solids, you'll get a consistent answer irrespective of the type of the material or the orientation or the amount. Then if that sort of answers the question between the difference. Is anyone, of, is anyone going to the Stockport conference at all? Well, hopefully it will. Because we'll have, we'll, we will have these units at the Stormwater Conference as well. And uh, later in the year at the uh, Water Conference in September, October, you'll have working units. You'll see the units uh, in a box cleaning and everything. So, But for me, it's it's easy to, to come down and just show you how the portable unit works and bring the fixed unit with me. And But like I said, for the fixed unit, we got uh, plenty of references. And so in um, a water supply clarifier, you, when your blank, blanket's beginning to break up, you get all this uh, fluff coming off and it, it'll be of different densities. And I was just wondering if we had a single point detector, um, how that would be affected by that phenomenon. Uh, you know, Philip, do you got any comment there? You know, it's, it's sort of like, and particularly in the... Um, you know, flat bottom clarifier, the, the sludge um, blanket may not have a uniform uh, profile and it might be a bit thin towards the edge where you tend to mount the, um, the instrument. So I presume we'd need some sort of outrigger pole, whatever instrument we use to get, uh, you know, represented. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess yeah, you're only measuring at one point in the clarifier and I think the, the, the blanket proper should be reasonably uniform, both vertically and horizontally, but yeah, with the, the, the lighter weight stuff on the top of the blanket when things are going bad, can be variable. And yeah, could be hard to work out appropriate set points and things. Well, the sensor, it's basically, you, you have to play with it. So it's very easy to, to to change the set points, but yeah, we can't tell you what the set point is, of course. Huh? That's, that's something you guys have to decide. Yes. Yeah, it's sort of more of a generic question for all instruments, you know. It's sort of like, yeah, it's one point of measurement, and then you can have this variability within the clarifier. So, But what we can do is can give you the portable unit and you can use it then for about two or three weeks or so and just do some trials with the portable unit and then you have an idea of what your levels should be. Would that help? Uh, yeah, it'd be nice, but um, I'll just 
probably have to have a talk to Philip. I don't know what we've. Uh, I can't recollect what's in our contract document and where, where we're going. Um, that's my problem. I sort of a bit divorced from the um, from that at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what do you reckon, Philip? Is it worth a play or? Um, um, I guess we'd want to see the issues at Brank's home resolved before we um, gave it a go, I think. It sounds like a fairly fundamental problem there, doesn't it? Yeah, we, we, well, uh, we don't know what the problem at Brank's home is. We know it's not the unit because the unit keeps working in one spot. they got two units. One unit's working beautifully. The other unit was working beautifully. They moved it to another spot, and that's where the unit keeps um the unit works. It's just uh, something. I think it's in the electricity that they use. Uh, there must be a pulse coming through. We have to check what's what's the problem. So it's not the. It's nothing to do with the units because once the units are repaired, we know they work. They test them. They work, and then um, something happens on site there. So it's a site issue. Uh, I just have to get over there and have a look on the site. Do some logging on on the power supply. There must be something. That's not correct because the other unit where well, the picture you saw on the clever that keeps working. That's been working for ages. So what are the problems of blank bring some? Is it to do with the winch or the No, the uh, the unit lose communication with the sensor. So the sensor is hooked up to a circuit board inside. Okay. And that's, that's where um it gets the power from um from the CBX, of course. Um, but that's hooked up directly to the 220 volt mains power that the unit needs. And I think uh, we checked everything in the unit and everything works fine. It's just that little circuit board of the sensor was fried. We replaced it and, and it, it happened again. And that's when we took a, a sample unit there. It's just a circuit board and that fried again. That's how we know that there's something with the electricity there. So we're going to check that out once we're there. But see, that's that's the advantage of, of dealing with a local company. If you got an issue, we'll be on site, we'll sort it out. Um, otherwise, if you deal with, well, other companies, I, I don't know what other companies will do the service, but we will make sure it will work. So um, that sludge blanket unit is now uh, with us. So we're going to, we are basically testing it. And I'm going to install it in a few weeks when they can come over in Invercargo. I'm going to commission and install it myself. And uh, we, we're probably going to check what the voltage is. So there's a lot of things we can do. But like I said, this we got plenty of uh, applications out there now. Um, like um, Ontario Tiamut is the worst. They, they Their sludge blanket is, is, is terrible because they got a lot of, um, well, they got a lot of uh, waste from milk and the proteins in there and, and fat. And that unit looks really, really bad. Uh, the new Plymouth one has been working fine as well. Um, they stopped it for half a year to do some more work on the units, and, and but that unit has been working fine. Mangary, they don't even know they have a unit. That's a problem because it just keeps working. They've got also two portables. But yeah, most of the Ottawa hangars got one unit. Most of the units are in, in Sydney. and. <laughs> But as I understand, the Brinks Home is the only potable water application you've got? Yes. Right. All the rest are wastewater. Right. Well, we we, 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 we're pushing the units. Uh, we don't, we're basically only doing it for four or five years now. So and before, when we started with Serlik, nobody knew of Telperm. You probably never heard of us. Uh, so we've been in New Zealand for 72 years now, but we, we've mainly... Uh, we specialized in instrumentation for oil and gas and 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 um, the heavy industries. We do geothermal and all that. So when we started with uh, water wastewater, that was basically because well we saw oil and gas was going nowhere. So we had to find other, and that's when we found Solik, and we found market water wastewater, and that's when we started pushing the product. But it took took us um, quite a few years before the first units were uh, implemented. Like I said, it, it was new, and uh, that report from Levin that helped, but still, it, it was um, it took us a while. 
most people know us now, but still, like I said, consultants, that's the one we need to. But there's a lot of them, so to find all of them and, and you, they change all the time from companies and oh God, very hard to keep. But oh, we, Philip, Philip's been there for decades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, we, we, we only know of people when we actually see them on the shows. And you only have basically the WIOC and you got the water conference. And it's always so busy there. It's it's hard. So right. we, we do it in little steps. Um, Toranga, they've got two sludge blanket systems now at the Temanga wastewater treatment plant. They're fully standardized. They started with a portable unit. Uh, then they had one fixed installation where they got an ITXIL in line. And now they're fully standardized. So the Wayari water to implant that will be two sludge blanket systems three microwaves um, we just put two um, fixed installations at uh, um, uh, Oportiki at the wastewater treatment water treatment plant there so it's 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 happening slowly uh, Australia they've got more references of course unfortunately they're a lot lot bigger right but we give we give operational warranty if people want, so we guarantee it will work. Yeah, so the um, portable unit uh, when you brought it around the office uh, a few months ago um, didn't have uh, GPS logging in it. Is that on the horizon? It's coming, but the first thing that's coming is the pH probe. Next on the list there is GPRS for. Yeah. Um, basically do a 3D mapping of your ponds and everything. So people are already doing it. Uh, Tim Arud did it uh, two years ago. Uh, there's a few people doing it now, 3D mapping of their ponds with sludge, with the sludge blanket sensor. Uh, yeah, GPS, it, it's coming, but yeah. Yeah, so with a portable sensor, if you wanted to use it in a fixed installation, you know, e.g. the um, clarifier at Waimati West, I gather there's no I.O., so no. you'd have to rely on the instrument vibration and a detector to pick that up to send it off to your SCADA system. Is that the way I would? Well, like I said, the portable unit is, is a data logger, so I, I wouldn't use that for for continuously measurement. This is merely you go on site, you do a measurement, and you will see where your fluff level is. And yeah. you come back every two or three hours and you do a measurement. Yeah, and, probably, and probably use your eye for that, but um, yeah, anyway. Yep. Oh, so, well, no, it's, it's good. I, I sort of, uh, I think I've gleaned as much as I can. Um, and this. Well, you're an, expert, you're an expert now in Solik. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it certainly seems impressive. You know, it's. Um, Look, it, we know it works. It's just, if you want to measure solids, um, don't use don't use stability sensors. That's basically is use stability sensor for stability. Use solid sensor for solids. Yeah, I've still got to get my head around suspended solids and stability. I, but um, my training goes back a long while, and um, I, I could never recollect ever coming across a relationship between suspended solids and stability. But um, things may have changed. Mm. Yeah, but like I said, uh, Peter, it's still yeah, signing again from home. Um, as far as I know, no one's done a study to to correlate, but just kind of get the idea of suspended solids and turbidity. If you put a hundred, say a thousand milligrams per liter into a liter, right? And you measure the suspended solids, you get a thousand milligrams per liter. Let's assume those thousand milligrams per liter came up as let's say hundred particles, and you did the turbidity, you'll get an arbitrary number, we'll call it a hundred. If you crushed all your particles from a hundred to a million, you'd get the same milligrams per liter suspended solids, but your turbidity would now be maybe five thousand because you've now got so much more scatter because your particles are that many, there's that many more of them. So your scatter will be far higher and you should, so your turbidity will be far higher. But whether you've got 100, 1,000 milligrams per liter as 100 particles 
or is a million particles, you've still got a thousand milligrams per liter. So I hope does that kind of go a little way to sort of give you some sort of difference between the two techniques. I suppose so. It's uh, we'll see the black art actually. The oh the, yeah, absolutely. Turbidity is black art. There's no doubt. Because yeah. I mean, it, 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 if you've got a thousand milligrams per litre, let's say as uh, silica sand, it's nice, it's shiny, it's white. Or if you have a thousand milligrams per litre of powdered activated carbon, it's dull and it's not very. The light doesn't scatter. So if you put your thousand milligrams per litre as silica sand, you'll get an off-scale turbidity purely because of the high degree of light scatter from the white silica sand. If you then look at the thousand milligrams per litre of powdered activated carbon, you'll get almost no scatter because the carbon will absorb all the light. So yeah. you've got exactly the same amount of suspended solids, but radically different turbidity readings simply because of the material that you're trying to measure. Mm. Yes, that's a good example. Well, probably what we see in the um, in the water industry is, uh, you know, you get uh, changes in colour and material over part of the flood event. So your turbidity, you know, I mean, it's an indicator rather than being a specific measure. I mean, I mean, just on the colour alone, if you've got, uh, if you've got, say, clear water, you're going to have zero suspended solids, and you're going to have um, zero turbidity. If you had that water that looked like very dark tea, you'd have zero suspended solids, but you would have a false turbidity because the light has been absorbed by the colour. So therefore, your scatter is affected. Therefore, your turbidity is affected. So color, if you're using white light, is affected. So if you keep, if you've got variations in color, and variations in particle size and type, and variations in particle material, you will get variations in turbidity if you're trying to correlate to suspended solids. Whereas all those three factors won't be affected if you're measuring suspended solids. Now, what I should do here? Does that does that make any more sense? Oh, yes, yeah, I've um, had experience with um, particle counters and to bit of mon monitors in the past and trying to do correlations and physical measurements and, yes, you end up just with a polygot mess, really. Mm. It's not a strong relationship at all. No. Maybe when you're getting into the, um, you know, the more higher concentrations, but certainly not what you encounter in, um, in the, uh, you know, water treatment um, phases, particularly the treated water side. Yeah, oh, are we uh, better informed, Philip? Yep, yep, no, that's good, thanks. Well, I'll send you the details anyway of the guy in Australia, uh, of the water treatment plant, because they, they've got a few units. Right, right, okay. Yeah. But All by right. myself, we, we give operational warranty that that's yeah we know it will work especially in the water treatment plant that make that's easier than than uh, wastewater not so volatile so but yeah yeah we've got that horrible decision to make you know um, price and performance I mean yeah you know, it's just devices at the um, upper end of both you know yeah I, th I think for fixed installations price wise it's it's approximately the same between the turbidity uh, units and and the Sirlik ones it's just the sludge blanket unit itself that's that's of course that's a big unit but um you, you're looking at well you get a lot more information and out of it but yeah the, I think the reason why we haven't sold many sludge blanket systems on water treatment plants is because it's it's not so volatile it's it's easier to control than uh, in a wastewater treatment plant. They need all that information in a wastewater treatment plant. I think in a water treatment plant, you probably don't need all that. And yeah. price. Yeah. And the history of the fact that most units in the past have failed to work. Yeah. So 
<laughs> we see the same thing that people, uh, uh, Wellington Water, they put in, uh, I think, four, five or six ultrasonics on, on the uh, on the clarifiers and they were decommissioned a few a few months later because it just didn't work. We showed them with our portable unit that sludge blanket system would work, but the problem with big councils is, is a lot of managers and oh, it's before it trickles through to the guys who actually make the decisions that that takes a long, long time and then they change organizations and then you just have to start from scratch again and Anyway, right, thanks everyone. I'm going to have to shoot off to another meeting, so I'll right. uh, we'll have to leave you there. Oh, cool. see so, yeah. Right, geez. So it's yeah, like I said, it's 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 difficult for us, but like I said, we we give the operational warranty. That's that's all we can promise. And we know from experience, they'll start with one sensor and and then they'll standardize on the solid because they know, we know it works. It's just. You have to convince yep. consultants and we have to convince you guys. That's that's the, the, the main thing. Yeah, All right. you need to get it right too. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we, we own a lemon already, so um, I'm not saying this is a lemon, but uh, you know there might be something else out there that's, uh, I don't know, not as good. I know, well, we I know. Normally, what we can do is if you decide to put our unit in, we can basically tell you, uh, we'll, we'll put it in there for a few months. If it, if it doesn't work, we'll take it out. Uh, and, and but yeah, that's that's what we call a trial. We've done that in the beginning quite a lot because yeah, people didn't believe us. Um, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of things, but like I said, I'll, if there is an issue, you call me and I'll be there to help you out. It's very easy for me. It's it's it's, it's not far. No, it'd right. be nice to get out and about again, wouldn't it? So, yeah, um, oh, I, I would love you to tell me now. I want you. I want to see you tomorrow. I'll be. I'll be there. <laughs> yes. All well, righty. Well, um, I've got to shoot off. So, um, I don't know, Philip. Should we catch up later? Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I can do. Yep. If you've got any more questions, anything, please uh, flick them through to us. Um, Whatever you need to know, let me know, and uh, I'll I can get the solid guys involved as well, so there's not a problem. Right, right. Okay, cheers. Okay, right, Philip, thank you very right, much for you. your time, Peter. Yeah. Have a good one. Yeah, you too. The sun's <laughs> coming out here and sharing it's nice. So we'll catch you next time. See right, ya. Cheers. Bye -bye. Right, see ya. Cheers. Bye. -bye.